Um, thanks everyone for, for coming today. Uh, I also share in the acknowledgement of the traditional owners and I extend my respect to uh, anyone here today with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage. Um, I actually attended uh, the launch of Law Week last week. Um, th this event is you know, part of uh, Law Week and part of Victoria Legal Aid's contribution to the week-long celebration of all that is law. Uh, and so a number of us attended the, um, the launch of Law Week last week, which was held at, at Waldron Hall. Um, the Wurundjeri woman who gave the welcome to country there uh, was particularly interested in the language of the Wurundjeri and, and bringing back the language groups. Um, so I think she was a Wathorong. Um, language group, uh, and she explained that Womanjika, which you know we, we sort of often hear in the welcome in the um, welcome to countries, the, the Womanjika um, actually kind of translates to um, come come with purpose. Uh, and I thought it was quite apt today that I feel that we have all come with purpose, or, or that you have come with purpose, to learn about um, a very uh, a very niche area of of law. I mean, Law Week um, often looks at issues that affect people broadly, um, but I think that it is um, somewhat unusual for people to turn out uh, to hear about something to do with administrative law. Um, as somebody who loves administrative law dearly, I am very grateful to each and every one of you for coming with the purpose um, of listening to my thoughts on a topic that I've been interested in for some time now, um, but I think that it's probably been a bit of a niche topic up until a certain event last year. Um, so I should say this, this um, paper that I'm talking to today, I actually originally prepared it for a conference of administrative law lawyers. So think of a bunch of boffins very interested in technical detail. Um, and the paper was you know, a fascinating one for administrative lawyers, um, but it's probably not one that anyone outside of administrative law or any member of the public would have been particularly interested in. That was all until just before Christmas last year when Centrelink decided that they would send in lieu of Christmas cards, uh, debt notices to individuals who were alleged to have been overpaid. Um, and the allegation was of course based on what is now known as the robo debt system, which involved automated data matching uh, between information from the ATO or data from the ATO and data held by Centrelink. Uh, and I think that really has changed uh, the interest and relevance of, of, of this topic about um, using technology to assist decision makers to make decisions. Um, because Centrelink RoboDebt, I think, is the first example of government um, decision making conducted with technology that's really captured the public imagination. Um, and unfortunately for Centrelink, I think the reason it's captured the imagination is because, of course, it has been um, plagued with problems. Um, I think that what it shows, it shows though two things that are very relevant for anyone um, who's sort of observing this. I think the first is that it demonstrates that government is absolutely using technology um, to make decisions. It, it is in the here and now. This is not something that we are waiting until we have robot judges to confront. Um, and I think the other thing that it shows is that these things have very significant consequences if they are not done well. Um, in January, our legal helpline received, I think it was 150% you know, increase in call load, um, and that was directly attributable to people who were uh, calling, saying, I've received this letter, what on earth do I do? Um, so it has significant consequences for individuals, it has significant co consequences for the rest of the justice system. Um, I also thought that this topic was probably quite a good one for Law Week because when we're talking about Law Week, I think that really what it is is a celebration of the rule of law. And fundamentally, the most important thing about the rule of law is that it means that government, as much as citizens, must comply uh, with our laws. Um, and I like to think of you know, administrative law as being the entire area of law that is dedicated to ensuring that governments comply with law. Um, and in particular, I often say that it's, you know, it's the law about the accountability of government power. Um, so as I said, Centrelink, I think, has given this topic new life. Uh, but if you're here today because you want to know about the ins and outs of the Centrelink decision-making process, then I'm afraid you might be a little bit disappointed um, because my topic actually focuses on technology-assisted decision-making, not automated decision-making. And there is a, there is a distinction. Um, essentially, when I talk about technology-assisted decision-making, I'm talking about technology being used to assist with everything up until um, but excluding the actual making of the decision. So everything that I will talk about today assumes that at somewhere along the line you have a human decision maker. 
Um, so in terms of the sorts of things that technology assisted decision making might look like, um, it might be something like the system providing the human decision maker with information about how to apply uh, the relevant law and policy. Um, and so if any of you have ever used um, eTax or as it's now known, um, MyTax, um, that's the sort of guidance that is provided there. So you've still got, you know, essentially an online form, but to the side, you've got little pop-up boxes that explain what this question is about and, and what's the sort of information it's looking for. Um, another possible uh, example of technology, uh, technology assistance um, would be technology that guides the decision maker through relevant facts, legislation and policy, but sort of closes off the relevant paths as they go. Um, and I think this sort of system we are starting to see more of, certainly in terms of public spaces. Um, so I don't know if any of you saw the uh, Mikey Finds website that was created a couple of years ago. It was around the time that Julian Burnside um, and his uh, crew of dedicated volunteers were challenging Mikey decisions in court. Um, and they actually created a website that somebody could, you know, basically say, look, I've, I've just been stopped by authorised officers and, and they could navigate through what their options were. So that's an example of, uh, I guess, a dynamic system that doesn't just go, take you A, B, C, D, but will take you from A to E to G, depending on what your answers are. Uh, and then finally, uh, technology could be used to actually make a recommendation to a decision maker. So essentially saying, uh, I've run my little technology brain through this and I think that the best decision for you to make is, is X, but ultimately it's still a matter for you. Um, so, so as I said, I'm not looking at automated decision making. I, I pull up short at the point of making the decision. Um, and the reason that I've done that is that automated decision making actually raises many complex issues. Um, I think there are practical issues, there are technology issues, there are audit issues, there are of course administrative law issues. Um, and my strong view is that you should walk before you can run. And I, I do believe that that is perhaps advice that perhaps Centrelink might have considered before they rolled out RoboDebt. Um, because I think that in rolling out the automated decision making as they have, um, they have definitely tried to run before they walk and unfortunately they tripped over their own feet. Now, when I talk about technology assisted decision making, I am talking about a range of technology. I mean, this is very technology neutral. I'm not thinking of any particular technology in mind. So um, it could be, you know, very sophisticated technology. So artificial intelligence or cognitive computing or, you know, any of the sort of, um, you know, little apps that are being developed using IBM Watson. Um, it could be all the way up that end of the scale. Um, and it could be all the way to the other end of the scale, scale as well, where you're looking at more sort of rule-based technology. So essentially taking the business rules that a human decision maker would have been relying on um, and, and you know, putting those into decision trees and then getting someone to actually code that. So what I'm about to say here is not limited to any particular type of technology. So as I said, we, know that, we now know that government is using technology. We've seen it with Centrelink very spectacularly. Um, I was actually surprised to discover when I started looking into this that at least at the federal government level, um, technology assisted decision making has been used by a number of key federal agencies since as early as 2004. Um, we don't really know much before then uh, and I think one of the only reasons that we know that they were doing it in 2004 um, is because the then Administrative Review Council um, actually did a report, a study into um, technology assisted decision making and, and through that actually spoke to agencies and learned that you know this stuff was already happening. So we know it's been as early as 2004, possibly earlier. And in fact, most of us will have probably experienced some form of technology assisted decision making as we go about our daily lives. So um, especially if you've engaged with Centrelink, the ATO um, or the Department of Immigration and Border Control. Um, so, for example, I've already mentioned um, eTax and MyTax. That is a form of automated, uh, sorry, technology-assisted decision making. Um, and you know, you'll have experienced it if you use that online system. And at the end of it, you actually get, you know, um, I guess a, a prediction of what your tax um, refund or liability is going to be. So, all of that's an example of of technology uh, forming views about things, providing that information to the user. But of course, that's also being provided to the ATO. Uh, if you've ever claimed a Medicare benefit through the Express Plus app, which I think has now sort of been moulded into um, the MyGov website, um, or if you've used a smart gate when you're arriving in Australia, 
Um, and I should note that with SmartGate, I mean, at the moment, it's basically reading off your passport and the chip that exists in your passport. Um, the government does actually have plans to do away with passports entirely and just go on the basis of scanning your face and comparing that to um, a database that will have everyone's biometric um, information in it. Um, you know, this is sort of a bit off topic, it's not looking at technology assisted decision making, but um, I would encourage you to consider these issues very carefully. I mean, it, it sounds fantastic that, you know, you just rock up at the airport, you get scanned on your face and, and off you go. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about it because I also know that there's another government agency at the Commonwealth level um, that is planning on developing a law enforcement database that has lots of photos in it, including social media photos, um, and they call it the capability which um, I don't know if you're into sci-fi, but that for me, it just kind of sounds a bit weird. So um, all of this technology is fantastic, but it does show that it can be used for convenience. It can be used to help individuals. Um, it can be used to detect crimes and, and that is you know, generally a good thing. But of course, it all depends on how you're using it. And something named the capability, um, I'm not entirely convinced that people necessarily have benign interests at heart. Uh, the other thing I'll, I just want to sort of flag when I said, you know, look, you've probably experienced this stuff. Um, think about the agencies that I'm talking about here. So Centrelink, the ATO and the Department of Immigration and Border Control. Three organisations that receive very large volumes of applications, but also are incredibly well funded. Um, and I do think it's interesting that the organisations that have clearly been using this for some time now are, you know, what, what you could sort of loosely term the money. Uh, organisations. Um, and I think that's really relevant when you're sort of talking about, um, you know, the, when, when you sort of then look at the justice system, because I think the justice system also has, you know, very high volumes of, you know, work that could be described as repetitive or transactional, but you're not necessarily seeing the same, um, the same automation or the same use of technology to assist in decision making. Um, you know, and I do wonder, and it's purely just a wonder whether funding has something to do with that. Uh, so anyway, so look, I think um, I've already sort of flagged that, you know, we're not really sure when government started using this stuff. The other thing we're not really clear about is we don't know the full extent of the use of technology assisted decision making. And that's a topic that I'm going to return to later on today. Um, however, one thing I think that's really obvious is that with both state and federal governments committing to digital transformations of government services, um, it's obvious that its use is only going to increase. Um, and so I think that you know, it's, it's useful to be thinking about these things now so that we can build administrative law principles into these systems rather than waiting until something like a robo-debt happens and trying to fix it up after the event. So what I wanted to do today was essentially go through a bit of an exercise with you of applying administrative law principles, you know, running the administrative law sort of ruler um, over technology assisted decision making and seeing if it stacks up and, you know, if it actually achieves the things we want, um, we want to achieve in government decision making um, or are there, are there some problems that we need to have a look at. So the first thing I need to do is actually say, well, you know, when we say administrative law principles, you know, which, which ones are you talking about? And of course, one of the great things about administrative law is that you know, you've got all these boffins who love you know, technical detail, but when it comes to well, what actually is administrative law and what are the objectives that it seeks to achieve, it's actually a very contested space. Um, and it really depends on what we want to get out of it. In terms of what I want to get out of administrative law, uh, I want decisions that are lawful, transparent and fair. Uh, and so today I'm going to be asking, um, does technology assisted decision making promote decisions that are lawful, transparent and fair by considering the traditional grounds of judicial review and components of administrative law such as uh, that relate to information such as freedom of information legislation and statements of reasons? So the first question, does technology assisted decision making promote lawful decisions? And I should actually just pause there. Um, I, before I sort of run on with my questions, I should say um, I, I do um, welcome any questions that you may have uh, through this presentation. I'm, I'm happy to take questions at the end as well, but if something I'm saying is, is firing off something for you, um, then please, you know, put your hand up and, and let's, let's deal with that there and then. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep going, you know, on my merry way. Um, so, yeah, so does technology actually assist decision making um, sorry, does technology assisted decision making promote lawful decisions? Um, now essentially a lawful or authorised decision is one that's been made by the right person and it's been exercised within the limits of the relevant statute and legislative instruments. 
Now this first question of who is the decision maker, um, as I've already said, I have assumed that there remains a human decision maker in all of this. Um, and so the assumption would generally be that they are the ones that are authorised to make the decision, um, either by the statute that confers the decision uh, making power or um, through a delegation. Um, one thing that is a little bit interesting around this question of who is the decision maker um, is the fact that when you've got technology assisted decision making, I think it's somewhat trite and artificial to say that the only decision maker is the human being or that the decision is uh, the decision of the human beings alone. Um, I think that with technology assistance, what we're seeing is, I guess, a shared performance of duties that fall short of delegation, um, but it's certainly something that is more than just the human being doing it all themselves. Um, and essentially, what it means is that you've got the technology or the technological assistant um, that will be doing things that otherwise the actual human decision maker would have had to do for themselves. Um, now, there's, there's an interesting question um, that I'm not going to go into detail about. Um, there is an interesting question about how the Carltona principle, which you know, the administrative lawyers will, will recognise, about how that applies. Um, I think for today, I think that it's sufficient to say that I do think that um, I do think that there probably will be at some stage a need for a court to actually consider this and confirm that yes, um, this shared responsibility between decision maker and technology um, is authorised by statutes. Um, I think they, they probably will need to turn their mind to that. Um, I believe that they will probably say yes, it is authorised. However, I think that it will largely depend on the sort of decision making setup that is brought to them for decision. Um, and what I mean by that is that essentially what technology assistant decision making provides the opportunity to do is essentially unbundle the decision making process and you can have lots of steps that are done by technology and then only some or even just the final step done by uh, the human being. Now I think that if the um, agency that is setting that process up um, continues to maintain that the human decision maker is ultimately responsible for the whole process and not just the final decision but is responsible for everything technology does as well, then I think the courts will say, yes, that's fine, you're authorised. I think where there will be problems is if agencies try to say, well, the only thing that you have jurisdiction to review or the only thing that we are taking responsibility for is the final act of saying, yes, tick, I accept that recommendation, Mr. Computer, um, and tries to somehow distance themselves from having responsibility for all the things that the technology's done. Um, because I think that doing that, essentially saying, well, we don't know what the technology does or we're not responsible for it or, you know, um, that's somebody else's problem. I think that runs the risk of creating administrative black boxes um, which are immune from review or accountability. Um, and I think that the courts would be very uncomfortable with that situation. So as long as the human being who's actually making the decision accepts responsibility for it all, I think we'll be fine about, you know, the right person making the decision. Um, so then we come to, we actually need to know what are the limits of the power that this human being uh, can exercise with the assistance of technology. Now, when somebody makes an administrative decision, they're actually undertaking two cognitive tasks. Um, the first thing they're doing is they're saying, all right, well, what's the scope of my power and what are, what, are there any limits um, on my power in the individual circumstances of the, the decision I'm called upon to make? Uh, and then they also then say, all right, well, given those parameters, um, what's all the information before me that's relevant to my um, decision? And they actually, you know, look at all of that information and then make the decision. So in respect to that first one, identifying the limits, um, I think that technology can assist in a number of ways here. Uh, technology can identify the correct question that the decision maker needs to determine, um, as well as identifying the relevant decision making criteria and any relevant or irrelevant considerations. Um, the technology can identify whether there are any procedures or matters which are necessary preconditions to the exercise of the power um, and can also look at whether they've been met or not. Uh, the technology can identify whether there's any evidence in respect of each of the matters on which the decision maker must be satisfied. So if, for example, one of the things you need to do um, is to provide evidence of your Australian citizenship, you know, the technology can say, yes, I've received that document. 
Um, and then the technology can also sort of draw out or highlight any particular issues that require the decision makers consideration and evaluation. So for example, there may be um, a range of criteria, you know, five of them are just threshold questions, you know, have certain boxes been ticked and declarations been made. Um, but it may be that there's one question that actually really re requires a human brain um, and it might sort of focus attention on that and say, look, don't forget about this one. Um, so if we sort of go through that, you know, um, in the context uh, of, say, assessing the validity of an application made under an act. So I think this is an area where it, it would make a lot of sense to have technology. Um, receiving applications is, um, you know, it's a very voluminous process. Um, a lot of the time when you look at statutes, there's a lot of technical manner and form requirements. Um, it's definitely something that lends itself to even that most basic of system involving just, you know, rules-based technology. Um, so for example, uh, technology, a technology assistant could identify the preconditions for a valid application, such as, you know, um, have the, the types of people who are allowed to make this application, you know, has this application been made by one of those people? Um, is it, you know, in the right form? Has any required fee been paid? Um, are there any matters that were required to be addressed and have they been addressed? Um, and, you know, has it been made within time? Uh, the technology assistant could then assess whether those conditions, preconditions have actually been met. Uh, and then it could identify matters which the human decision maker needs to consider further, such as a discretion to um, accept an otherwise invalid application um, or some step that's required to be taken before rejecting an application. For example, um, perhaps the human decision maker needs to contact the applicant and give them an opportunity to rectify any deficiency. Um, now, that's just one very sort of small, almost trite example. Um, there are many other possible examples and they're really only limited by the technological resources that are available to the agency. Um, and I think the possibilities are increased if an agency has access to cognitive com com computing um, because that's not limited to a binary assessment of compliance. So it's not just limited to did you pay your fee or not. Um, it can actually assess the extent of compliance in respect of qualitative or discretionary criteria. Um, and so because of this, I think that in this respect, technology assisted decision making actually promotes lawful decisions because it ensures that decision makers understand and act within the limits of their powers. Um, and I think that these forms of assistance can assist in the transparency of the decision because once the technology has, has identified you know, these issues to the decision maker, um, it's not a very long step to then convey that to the person who's actually affected by the decision. Um, I think technology can also assist decision makers with, you know, things that are called soft law. So in particular, agency policy about her, how certain discretions will be exercised. Um, I do think that there are some additional considerations that are required to ensure that the technology assistance doesn't lead to inflexible application of policy. So I think we need to keep in mind that, you know, this is soft law, it's not hard law, and we shouldn't use hard coding to make soft law hard law. Um, so again, as with um, hard law, technology could assist in identifying factors relevant to the policy and whether those factors are present on the facts of the matter. Um, and you know, so essentially the technology could apply the policy to the facts. Um, now, because I've already said, you know, this shouldn't be a way of making soft law hard law, I do think that if we're going to use technology to um, apply policy, then there probably also needs to be a prompt for the human decision maker to actually separately consider the question of whether the policy should apply in the individual circumstances of the case. Um, because of course, you know, policies are great for ensuring consistency across decision making, but they're not the same thing as a rule. So there, there is still that residual discretion for a decision maker to say, well, look, in the facts of this particular case, it is not appropriate to apply the policy and I'm going to make a decision um, that would be different to the one the policy would suggest. Um, so I do think that the technology assistant should identify to the decision maker that, you know, um, when it's giving guidance about policy, that it is giving guidance, you know, on policy and, and not a hard law. Now, I anticipate that people will more readily accept technology assistance in identifying the limits and the scope of a decision-making power. Um, I, I suspect though they're probably gonna need a bit more persuasion about the appropriateness of technology assistance evaluating information um, relevant to those limits and scope. And I think that's because limits involve hard lines. Um, you either cross them or you don't. 
And I think that the task um, of identifying those limits, it, it conforms with our perception about what technology is good at, um, i.e. it applies rules and there are binary answers. There's a zero or a one, a yes or a no. In contrast, I anticipate that people will be a bit more sceptical of technology's ability to assist in the cognitive tasks of evaluating information available um, that's relevant to you know, the criteria of a decision and then synthesising that into an overall decision. Um, nevertheless, I, I do suggest that technology has a role to play in assisting the ev evaluative task. Um, in addition to identifying the relevant questions and criteria, uh, technology could extract and produce information that's relevant to those questions and criteria, um, and it could be done in formats with which we're familiar. So I, I don't think it's beyond techno technological ability um, to be able to get the technology assistance to essentially prepare a brief to the decision maker that would look um, for all intents and purposes, you know, just like a brief that a human being would provide for a decision maker. Um, Alternatively, maybe it would be in new sorts of formats. So, for example, there could be an app that guides a decision maker through to select and filter information that a decision maker considers depending on their answers to a series of questions. So, going back to the Mikey Finds um, website, you could have something similar for an actual decision maker, you know, depending on you know, whether they're answering yes or no at certain points, that might then guide them to, to other questions to consider. And so, again, such assistance would promote lawful decisions by ensuring that the decision maker has all relevant information available to them, while still preserving the ultimate evaluation to the human decision maker. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but as I've been sort of saying, well, yes, it can do that, I've really been emphasising that can. I, I, do, I think that technology can promote lawful decisions. It doesn't guarantee them, though. Um, I think that while we are still in the realm of technology assisted decision making, there is still plenty of scope for the fallible human decision maker to get it wrong. Um, for example, they can still draw unreasonable inferences from the information produced, um, they can still bring a biased mind to the decision, um, or they can just you know, say to the technology assistant, well, I'm just not doing what you say I should do and I'm just going to ignore um, your guidance. Um, they might even just do that by mistake. Um, and so I think that, and, I, and I, I don't think we should get too hung up about this because I think that the risk that a human decision maker will, despite technology assistance, make an unlawful decision is kind of the inevitable consequence of relying on a human decision maker. Um, I think the more we limit the scope for the human decision maker to bring their own mind to an issue or decision, um, the more we approach the domain of technology replacing the decision maker. Um, and as I said, I do think that there are a lot more complex issues involved in that area. Uh, I think that technology can assist in mitigating the risk of flawed consideration of relevant information. So for example, I think that big data presents some real opportunities here. Um, you know, I would be encouraging agencies to actually start tracking you know, using big data um, how their decision makers are, are reaching decisions um, and use that to actually identify trends. You know, how are certain criteria being assessed? Um, you know, don't just look at the overall decision that is made, but actually sort of drilling down and looking at um, you know, how views are reached on, on particular criteria. Um, because you could then, once you know trends, you can also start looking at the outliers. You say, well, that's interesting. Why, why, are the, you know, why is there a group of decisions that are being decided in such a different way um, to the rest of the cohort? There might be very good reasons for it, but it's at least something to trigger a question about you know, what's going on there. Um, and I also think that that helps not only in agencies sort of monitoring and, and sort of um, continually improving their performance in administrative decision making, um, I also think it's useful for decision makers themselves, you know, to actually um, maybe reflect on the reasonableness of their decision, um, possibly even before they make them, you know, so they might come to a view and then want to see how does that stack up with, you know, how these decisions are ordinarily made. Um, and again, if they see themselves as an outlier, maybe that's a, re a reason to sort of go, oh, you know, have I got it right? So, as I said, I, I think that technology-assisted decision-making can promote lawful decisions. Um, I think the really interesting question, though, is will it? And to answer that question, I turn to the principle of transparency and ask the question, does technology-assisted decision-making promote transparent decisions? Uh, now, the doc doctrine of separation of powers, um, you know, as we all know, means that it's for the courts and, and not the executive to determine whether a decision has been lawfully made. 
Um, an assertion by the executive that the decision was lawfully made will not make it so. Applying this reasoning to technology assisted decision making, it is not enough for the executive to claim that it is using or will use technology in a way that promotes lawful decisions. There must be information available upon which the courts, integrity bodies and the public can assess this question for themselves. Or to put it another way, you may say that technology has assisted you to make a lawful decision, but how do I know that? So, I think that transparency in administrative decision making um, can be advanced through statements of reasons, um, review both judicial and merits, uh, and through proactive and reactive release of information through freedom of information, legislation and the requirement to produce annual reports. Um, in respect of statements of reasons, uh, the main thing that I want to say about that um, is really relating to the disclosure that there's been a technology, a technological assistant at all. Um, so generally speaking, when a decision maker prepares a statement of reasons, they should identify who actually made the decision. Um, and so there's this question of, you know, where the ultimate decision maker has been a human, but that human has been assisted by technology, possibly to quite a great extent, um, should that actually be disclosed in the statement of reasons? Um, my view is that it should be disclosed. Uh, and the reason for that is that I think that you can only properly understand the nature of the decision if you understand that there's been this, this fusion between technology and human being. Um, and I think that essentially if we have a look at why people, why agencies are using technology assistance, especially technology assistance that extends beyond um, sort of static commentary on, on legislative provisions. So sort of things that are more than just that sort of e-tax, my tax sort of, you know, this is how, what this question is asking and the sort of information you're required to provide. But, you know, when, when we're looking at the stuff that's, you know, um, closing off certain considerations um, because of the answers that have been given earlier. Um, and when we're looking at the sort of uh, technology assistance that's actually making recommendations, I think the reason why agencies will be looking at that sort of stuff is precisely because it relieves the human decision maker of some of the cognitive task of making the decision either because it makes it quicker and easier to process large numbers of um, decisions or because they want to reduce some of the risk that comes with relying on fallible human beings. And so I think that technology assisted decision making scaffolds or frames a decision maker's consideration of the relevant issues, thereby ensuring that the right ones are considered and the irrelevant ones are not. And I think it's therefore entirely artificial to say that the decision reached by the human decision maker is theirs alone. Rather, it's a decision based on or augmented by the technological assistance that's been provided by the technology. Uh, and I think that failing to disclose the technological assistant may actually constitute a form of misleading by omission. Because unless told otherwise, most people would assume that a decision is made by the human decision maker and that the findings in the statement of reasons were in fact made by the human decision maker. Um, and as I'll discuss in a moment, the way in which you challenge a decision or try and review a decision um, may be affected by the existence of technological assistance. And so I, I do think that it's necessary for the statement of reasons um, to disclose the existence of technology assistance um, if the person affected is to be given a genuine opportunity to decide whether and how to challenge that um, decision. Um, and again, I, I would say that, you know, even though I'm not really talking about Centrelink today, it, it does sort of highlight some of these things. Um, one of the things that caused the most concern when those letters first started coming out was the fact that nobody knew who to talk to. Um, when there is a problem, somebody wanted, you know, there's that natural human, human urge, I don't understand something, please explain it to me. Um, and there was no identification of any human being involved, there was no identification of a human being they could talk to, um, but there also wasn't really any identification that this had been made um, in any way other than the way we have, you know, that we know decisions are made, i.e. by human beings. So that, that technology stuff really only started to come out after the event. Um, now, it may also be appropriate for a statement of reasons to disclose any findings, recommendations or conclusions offered by the technological assistant and adopted by the human decision maker. Um, I say may, you know, it might sort of depend on, on the particular process or decision. Um, and I think that it also depends on how much the human decision maker actually considers 
um, and discloses the reasoning of the assistant as opposed to merely adopting the suggested findings. So I think the more that um, somebody is really just sort of, you know, saying, yep, I agree with your recommendation, Mr. Computer, um, I think the more there's a need to actually articulate what it was that the computer was recommending. Um, it's a bit different if it's just, you know, producing a list of factors and, and the human being is then very much bringing their own mind to it. Um, I also think that disclosing the existence of technology assistance could provide an opportunity for agencies to actually build co public confidence in their decisions and decision making processes. Um, for example, it may be that persons affected by decisions would have greater confidence in them and be less likely to challenge them if they know the technology has assisted the decision maker to consider the necessary questions and the information relevant to those questions. Um, Getting down to some of the detail for, for anyone who's here today from an agency, um, I think that if you are going to identify any statement of reasons that yes, um, technology was used uh, to assist in the making of this de decision, uh, then I think that you should also identify which version of um, the technology was used. Um, as we know from anyone who you know, has an iPhone or um, any other sort of devices, the updates come thick and fast these days. Um, and if there is ever a need to review or challenge a decision, um, we are going to need to know uh, what version of code was used, just as when we're reviewing um, decisions when there's been legislative change, we kind of need to know, well, which version of the Act applied at the time. Um, my position that a statement of reasons should disclose technology assistance, I think, is strengthened by considering the, qu the contrary question, which is, well, why shouldn't a statement of reasons disclose technology assistance? Um, and I think that given that technology assistance is permissible and in some instances may even be desirable, um, it's unlikely that a decision will be successfully challenged on the fact of technology assistance alone. Um, and so, and, and to the extent that disclosure does lead to an increase in challenges because people do not trust the technology assistance, then your problem's not one of disclosure, it's one of public confidence in technology assisted decision making. Uh, and I don't think that problem will be resolved by being secretive about the use of technology. Um, in fact, the opposite is not only likely, but I think we've seen it. Um, I think if we look at what happened last year with both Census and then again Centrelink, if people don't trust uh, the technology and ask for information and that information is not provided, um, people get very worried indeed. So I think disclosure and transparency are important, um, if not necessary, for building public confidence in and acceptance of technology assisted decision making. Um, and finally, I think that technology assistance is going to increase the ease of disclosing findings of fact um, and the information on which those facts were based in the reasoning process. So, um, you know, the technology assistant's going to have to have identified those things either to itself or to the human decision maker. And so I don't think it's a particularly onerous task to then take that and put it into a statement of reasons. Um, I should say, just with all statement of, statements of reasons, um, they tend to be better quality and more useful um, if they are actually prepared at the same time as the decision itself. Um, that's not going to change with technology assistance. Um, in fact, I think that um, technology assistance actually provides a way of making statements of reasons you know, a little bit easier as well because as you know, the decision maker is going through clicking here and clicking there and yes, no and all that sort of stuff, um, technology can actually be designed to create an audit trail. So you would almost, you, you, could, you could design into a system to almost have an, an automated, um, maybe not statement of reasons, but at least an audit trail of, of decisions made along the way or, or factors considered. Um, getting into review of technology assisted decisions then, um, technology assisted decision making does present challenges for both judicial and merits review. Um, I think the challenges for judicial review are largely matters of evidence and efficiency. Um, I think the challenges for merits review are much more significant um, and I think they may even raise questions about uh, whether merits review has any utility and purpose uh, in, an, in a technology assisted world. Uh, so with merits review, on the one hand, um, technology assistance at first instance will have little effect on the merits review function, especially since the reviewer is not bound by the original decision. Um, so although the reviewer stands in the shoes of the original decision maker and has the same powers, functions and discretions as the original decision maker, um, the reviewer can still inform themselves as they see fit. And so they wouldn't be bound to take into account any findings or recommendations or conclusions that were offered by the technology um, or relied upon by the human decision maker at first instance. Um, but where you have had technology assist a decision maker at first instance, 
I think a question arises as to the extent to which it would be desirable for a merits reviewer to utilise the same technology assistance and, and you know, be in the same shoes as, as the original decision maker. Um, because if technology assistance provides the opportunity to improve the quality and accuracy of decisions and reduce the cost of making them, it seems to be, I think, um, a little short-sighted to say that we'll only have those benefits available at first instance, um, but then we're still going to rely on the fallible, inefficient, costly human decision maker doing the whole decision um, on merits review. Yet if the same technology is going to be used by both the first instance decision maker and then the merits reviewer, does the scope for reaching a different view on what is the correct and preferable decision diminish? In essence, does technology assistance review, reduce the need for or the utility of merits review? Now, another alternative is perhaps that the merits review bodies um, develop their own technology to assist in decision making. Um, and this might be an attractive option for some of the high volume jurisdictions such as VCAT. Um, however, this alternative may lead to that very awkward situation where different technology assistance um, is provided about the same statutory functions and powers. And, and I think the efficiency of such an approach is somewhat doubtful. Um, and, I, and I certainly think that if we just look at this from you know, the perspective of a state budget, um, the government's probably not going to be thrilled about the idea of funding you know, an agency to develop guidance and then funding VCAT to develop entirely separate guidance, but on the same decisions. So I think this is something that needs further consideration um, by everyone who's interested in merits review. Um, and I also think that for any agencies, agencies that are developing technology assistance, um, they really should look beyond their own organisations and consult with other bodies that might be called upon to review the merits of their decisions that have been made with the assistance of technology. Um, so then turning to judicial review, um, I think that technology assisted decisions are still capable of being judicially reviewed. Um, I do think though that, this, uh, that the, the review is going to be made much more difficult and expensive because it's going to need um, lawyers and the courts to engage with and understand what the technology is doing. Um, now when a court reviews an administrative decision it's essentially considering the fundamental questions of what did the statute require to be done? And was that in fact what, what occurred in this instance? And I think that comparison of what was required and what was in fact done, um, you, you can still do that uh, comparison even where technology has been used to assist a decision maker. Um, however, if anyone you know, here has ever been a party to or acted for a party to a judicial review proceeding, um, you'll realise that such proceedings are rarely determined in such neat and simplistic fashion. Um, often it is necessary to consider in great detail, but of course not with an eye attuned to error, um, the procedure that was adopted by the decision maker in their reasoning process. Um, the statement of reasons is ordinarily the primary evidence of such matters, but it may not be sufficient to identify an error in technology assisted decisions. And it's at this point that technology assisted decision making begins to look a bit more complicated than the human only variety. Because where some of your procedure or your reasoning process has been embedded into technology, then understanding what has been done and, what, and, and, and why may require a court to look underneath the graphical user interface or the GUI and peer at the code beneath. And it's at this point that I think a lot of lawyers start to feel very squeamish. Because considering how a technology program or an app has been coded to assist a decision maker, might require additional evidence, including evidence from expert witnesses. Um, and it's likely that such additional evidence is going to have consequences for the length and expense of judicial review proceedings. Um, and the following example illustrates the evidentiary issue. Consider that you've got a technology app that guides the decision maker through a statutory test, um, and it includes consideration of interpretation provided by relevant case law. Um, the human decision maker, because of this app, the human decision maker no longer has to consider independently the interpretation of that statutory test. So let's just say that it's something that requires some sort of reasonableness standard. No longer has to think about, you know, how is reasonableness interpreted in this way? Um, it's, already been, it's already been done. The court's considered it and somebody's considered that and they've coded it into the technology. The problem is that if that st statutory test was misconstrued, and this is particularly the problem if the view about it has been formed by somebody within the agency as opposed to a court, 
Um, if that statutory test was misconstrued when the technology was developed, uh, then that means that every decision that's going to be made using that technology is going to be affected by that misconstruction. But you're not actually going to be able to pick that up without actually breaking out you know, the technology, looking at the code and actually seeing um, what guidance was you know, given to the technology. Now, revealing such an error may require at worst um, consideration of the code or the programming, um, or at least, um, at the very least, the business rules. Um, and I think where the problem, where the evidentiary problem really comes in is that, let's face it, most judicial officers and lawyers, probably most people in this room, um, some, you know, there are some exceptions, but most of, of us mere human beings, um, would be unlikely to be able to comprehend code without the assistance of an expert witness. And uh, I think that's, you know, that's a real challenge for judicial review because as costly as they have been, um, they generally can survive without expert witnesses. And we all know that once you get experts involved, um, things get very costly indeed. Um, now, review is not the only way that we achieve transparency in decision making. Um, we've also got the good old FOI Act. Um, so, most FOI statutes do require agencies to publish information regarding their policies, procedures and guides used in administrative decision making. Um, and, I think, and, and there is one view that uh, this obligation um, doesn't extend to the technology that's used to assist decision making um, on the basis that the technology is really just the digital form of rules that are prescribed and available elsewhere um, in statutes, regulations and policy. Um, and given that the source of these rules are, are generally published, then why would you also publish the digital um, format? Um, the other view is that the obligation does extend to technology assistance on the basis that technology assistance are greater than the sum of the legislation, regulations and policy upon which they are based. Um, as such, technology assistance may constitute guidance that is separate from and additional to the guidance that you could find in the constituent policies and other instruments. Um, I think even if, even if you take the former view and you say, well, look, I, I don't think it's necessary, I don't think the FOI Act requires us to publish, you know, the code or, or sort of the business rules upon which our technology assistant has been based, um, I think it still would be open to individuals to request that information, um, especially the business rules um, used to develop code and possibly the code itself, uh, because given the broad definitions of document found in FOI legislation, um, I do think that both business rules and code would constitute documents for FOI purposes. And so the question then becomes whether agencies would seek to rely on any exemptions in respect of those rules or code. Um, and early indications are that they may. Um, so there was a case in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal last year of Cordova and Australian Electoral Commission. Um, now that didn't actually involve administrative decision making, but what it did involve was the code of a computer program that was used by the AEC to read and count Senate ballot papers um, where you record the vote below the line. And they essentially um, successfully argued that that code was a trade secret. Um, because that code and that program was not just used for the Australian Senate elections, um, but it was also used for other elections that the AAC conducts on a fee-for-service basis. So, for example, um, when they're conducting elections for, for private organisations like un unions or um, I think even Commonwealth federal departments use it for like their EBA negotiations. Um, now, I think that it's probably unlikely that agencies engaged in administrative decision making will face that same tension between their statutory functions and their um, fee-for-service functions. Um, and that's in part because of the nature of most agencies' ordinary functions. Um, and as such, it may be that the presidential value of Cordova is very limited to its specific facts. Um, alternatively, it could be a sign of things to come. Um, it may be that, you know, it might be that the trade secrets exemption is unlikely to be available, um, but there's lots of other exemptions that might be available. For example, an agency may seek to rely on exemptions relating to the deliberative processes of agencies um, by claiming that the code or business rules on which the code is based constitutes opinions, advice or recommendations to a decision maker and that disclosure would therefore be contrary to the public interest. Um, and again, I do think there is, that there's probably some interesting warning signs coming out from Centrelink. Um, there have certainly been a, a, a vast number of FOI requests made to Centrelink. Um, my understanding is that not a lot of those have produced um, a lot by way of documents. Um, and I'm certainly not aware of any code or business rules being released yet. 
Um, it may just be that they you know, got a bit of a backlog because of the volume of applications and we will see that um, in time. I'll leave you to draw your own inferences there. Uh, the final question I want to have a look at is really this question of you know, who's benefiting from technology assisted decision making. Um, and in particular, I think that this question can be explored, explored by asking the question of does technology um, assisted decision making promote fair decisions? So I think that technology assisted decision making presents some challenges to both the actual and perceived fairness of a decision um, and as such the public's acceptance of this form of decision making. Um, in particular, who should have access to the technology that is used to assist decision makers and are decisions made with the assistance of, te of technology sufficiently independent? In terms of access, um, you know, this really comes down to this idea that you know, public information, it's a public resource and so it's not just there for the public sector to use but it should be you know, allowed, to be, allowed to run free um, and have the public gain from it as well. And I think that you know, technology assistance, it, it provides a more efficient means of accessing and understanding information relevant to administrative decision making. Um, but I, I think that they're not the only parties who could benefit from this information. Um, the citizens who seek these decisions um, could also benefit from accessing this information to understand efficiently their rights and responsibilities. And I think the technology really has the potential to exacerbate um, or to ameliorate the natural information asymmetries that already exist between government and citizen. And I think that if we only limit the technology assistance to agencies, we're just going to exacerbate those asymmetries. Um, whereas if we extend access, then we can reduce them. Um, personally, I think that we should be doing everything we can to reduce those asymmetries. Um, I think there's also economic reasons to provide equal access to technology assistance. Um, so just as government uses technology to reduce the cost of processing all of those applications and making the administrative decisions, um, so too will a citizen seek to reduce the cost of each interaction with government. Um, if we just think about the amount of hours that some people spend trying to process, uh, trying to navigate administrative processes, um, trying to understand what it is they need to do to access um, a service or a benefit from government, um, that's all wasted economic time. Now it's not to say that the assistance that is provided to the decision maker, that, you'll, that the exact same portal or web app, app or you know, thing, um, that the citizen will get access to that exact same thing. But I think that once you've gone through all that thinking of what are our business rules, what are our decision trees, what's the code, it's really just about putting a different user interface on, one for the decision maker and one for um, the, the user or the citizen. So I think that it, it can be done and I think that there are already examples of that uh, with the ATO and DHS but it does, I think, I think it will be easier to do um, if it is actually part of the design of the technology assistance um, rather than trying to bolt it on later. Um, I also think that there are going to be some challenges around the independence and transparency of decision making um, because I think that the public acceptance of government decision making does depend on, among other things, you know, this idea that the decision maker was independent and wasn't just um, following the bidding of, of government. And I think if not designed well, technology assistance could undermine or reverse some of the confidence in administrative decision making that's been built over the years. Um, so I think that they do, I think that agencies do need to confront and deal with the inevitable perception that technology will be less independent than a human being. Um, and that's because technology has to be created. So it needs to be created, it needs to be maintained, it needs to be operated by someone. And let's face it, that someone is the agency. Um, and so technology will just naturally be thought of as sort of subordinate to or controlled by you know, the agency. Um, quite frankly, I think the alternative is um, pretty undesirable because if you, are, if, you, if you have a computer that's not controlled, maintained, you know, subordinate to human beings in your agency, um, then what you've got is a machine that escapes its programming and wreaks havoc on human society and that would also be bad. Uh, so in administrative law, I think we've got an uncontrollable assistant or decision maker is undesirable. Um, so leaving aside havoc of human society, it's also bad in administrative law um, because decision makers have limits on their statutory powers and they need to stay within those. But even within those limits, human beings, human decision makers must bring their own mind to the decision independent of their supervisors within the agency. And I think there's a real question of how can a technology assistant programmed by an agency also be independent of that agency? Um, 
Now, one view, because we're talking about technology-assisted decision-making, maybe we don't need to worry about this. Maybe it's not necessary for it to be independent because ultimately the technology is not making the decision. And as long as the human decision-maker brings an independent mind, then we're fine. Um, but again, this view starts to run up against this, you know, this artifice that in technology-assisted decision-making, the guidance provided by the technology assistant and the decision made by the human are separate and independent. And as I've already said, I actually think that what we're looking at is more of a merger. Um, And so as I was saying before, you know, technology kind of augments and shapes and so there was that discussion when I was talking about merits review about, um, you know, when, when you've got technology that's navigating a human decision maker through what is the correct and preferable decision, um, how do we know that what is correct and preferable um, will be determined by the agency when it programs the technology rather than leaving it to the human being um, when they consider and make a particular decision? Um, now, it may be that some people say, well, look, that, that concern is not reasonable or rational, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Um, and I think that ignoring the concern will not address it in the minds of people affected by decisions or the public. And I think if the concern goes unaddressed, um, then it will affect public confidence in decisions made with the assistance of technology. Um, I think the way of managing all of these concerns um, is through transparency, not just in individual decision making, but also in the management um, of technology assisted decision making generally. Um, I think that agencies should be transparent about the extent to which it uses technology to assist decision making. Um, so I think they should start by disclosing it in statements of reasons. Um, I think they should publish information about it in their websites and um, on their websites and in their annual reports. Um, you know, agencies are already publishing information about the services that citizens can use online. Um, but generally it's pretty limited to functional guidance about how a citizen can actually engage with the online service. Um, there's not a lot of information about what happens to the information once it's submitted by the citizen. Um, and in particular, if the online service is integrated with a technology assistance that's sort of operating behind the scenes. Um, and I think that publishing such information will allow public debate and scrutiny of technology assisted decision making to ensure that it is being used in a way that enhances rather than undermines the quality and integrity of administrative decision making. Um, failing to do so will breed resentment and suspicion about black boxes being created by government. Um, now I wrote those words last year in July and I can't help just feeling a little bit smug about them after seeing what happened with Centrelink and with um, the census. Um, I think that we need to understand that even though we're talking a lot about technology, what we're really talking about is what it is to be human. Um, and I think that we need to understand that uh, there are fallibilities about humans. We've already seen how we are a little bit fallible when it comes to using technology. And I think we also need to appreciate that the people who are affected by our decisions um, or by any administrative decision is by and large going to be a human being. Um, and I think that we need to respect that and we need to work, um, we need to find ways of making this work, uh, recognising that there are humans involved and not pretending that we were all machines. So ultimately my conclusion is that technology can promote lawful and fair decisions if they are designed to do so. Um, so if we want it to happen, we can make it happen, but if we are ignorant about it or if we overlook it, then it probably won't happen. Uh, now, ordinarily I would sort of finish this paper by, you know, sort of going through some tips and tricks for agencies that are considering um, embarking on, administ on technology assistance in decision making. Um, but I might just sort of end it there and see whether anyone has any questions about this topic. I'm quite interested. Oh, yes, oh, so we do, um, we do actually have uh, people who are sort of um, using technology, see so the benefits of technology, um, to attend this remotely. So there might also be some questions, as I understand it, of the speakers. <laughs> hmm. I'm quite interested in what you see as the distinction between technology-assisted decision-making as opposed to automated decision-making. So where there is, is it about where the input comes from, whether the individual puts the input or a decision-maker put, uh, put, um, inputs information? So for example, if my last name was Trump, and thankfully it isn't, and I said, look, Mr. Computer, find anybody who's from Iran and cancel their visas, would you call and then I get my Kaltura computer to mm -hmm. 
send all the letters out, would you call that automated or would you call that technology assisted? Uh, I think that's a fantastic question. I think that would probably be, I think because the human has actually said this is what should happen, cancel the visas of everyone in this group, I think that is still technology assisted. In some ways that's a bit different to what I'm talking about. So that's, that's implementing a decision that a human being has made. Even um, though they haven't identified Even though they haven't the identified who the individuals are. Their decision. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. Um, because I think that they've, you're clearly capable or you're clearly able to identify who the people are. It's just going to be a very exhaustive job to do it by hand. Um, so I think that's, that's a big data decision I would actually suggest. Um, so that's also something that I haven't really sort of talked about much about. I've talked about how, dig, how big data can help decision makers to reflect on their decision making. Um, but you're right, I haven't sort of gone down that path of, well, you know, um, again, I don't know if you, uh, I haven't gone down the path of how governments might use big data to essentially, um, yeah, decide on the outcome of certain decisions, but not actually have a particular individual before them, like make them, make them on, on the basis of a group. Uh, and I think that they're, look, that's another fascinating area. Um, but yeah, look, I'd probably say that's, that's still a human being, but yeah, it, it's sort of, I guess, I wouldn't call that technology assisted, I'd probably call that big data decision making. Um, in terms of where I sort of draw the line, as I said, I, I sort of think about it as everything but the kitchen sink. So the decision, the cognitive function, that's the kitchen sink. I kind of think of technology assistance as everything leading up to it. Um, if you want something that is a little bit more robust, then I would encourage you to have a look at uh, the Administrative Review Council's report on this automated assistance in administrative decision making. Um, that's from 2004. Uh, and they sort of define what, a, what an expert system is. Um, and I think the Ombudsman also has, oh yeah, the Ombudsman has a best practice guide on automated decision making, um, which was published in 2007. Okay. Yeah. No? Okay. Any other questions? Never sure at this part whether it's because I've completely lost everyone, you know, whether it's actually not as fascinating a topic as I find it, um, or if everyone's just sort of sitting there going, oh my goodness, what are we, uh, not just what are we getting ourselves in for, but what's already been happening for 13 years. You say that it, you should disclose um, the fact that technology is assisted the decision. Sorry, just give the mic, please. They can't hear you as well on the recording. You say that, um, a decision maker should disclose that technologies assisted the decision and that it, I suppose, obfuscates or gives the person less chance to understand how the decision could be wrong. Mm. But do you think there's actually any appellable error that arises from it? Uh, from not disclosing From not it. disclosing that it was technology assisted? I don't see that I don't see think there's any appellable error. Um, I, don't think, I don't think that the, I don't think you could say that your decision um, I don't think you could say your decision was unlawful if you didn't disclose it. Um, I can certainly imagine a court being very unhappy if a judicial review proceeding um, commenced and proceeded on the basis that it was a human decision maker and it ran along the, the, the usual way um, and then somebody finds out halfway through the um, process that actually there was technology involved and what we thought was just you know, a human making a decision and the statement of reasons is really all you've got because, um, you know, let's face it, we're not going to put witnesses on the stand and we can't break open their heads. Um, if we then find out down the track that actually um, there's a whole technology system that has really shaped and augmented um, and guided the decision maker through the process. So I could imagine a court being pretty upset about that, especially because it would have, it would delay the proceeding um, and it would increase the cost of the proceeding. So I'd be seeking costs. <laughs> um, I'm just a bit concerned because I'm not very technological. I feel I'm one of the least technological lawyers around. I'm not going to tell you where I work. Um, my worry is there are so many glitches in the technological system already that have been uncovered. For an example, leap, um, mm -hmm. you know, criminal law. And look, I'm sure there's a lot more, and I know there's a lot more examples. So. 
could there be a whole minefield here? Like you design a system, but because it's operated, is that right, by a person, the the input or the setup of it could be... And that's always yeah. tested by laws, I suppose. So is that how it sort of goes? I thought it would have been good if you gave some examples as to... Because that's happening now, isn't it? The tech, decision makers are using technology already, um, aren't they? Absolutely. And so, um, and on that example front, I, when I sort of started looking at this issue, that's sort of actually what I wanted to... I wanted to sort of go through and actually step through. Here's an example of where it works. The challenge is it's, there's just no information out there. Um, I trawled through the Department of Human Services website um, to even find and satisfy myself that yes when you're lodging the Medicare benefit um, claims, uh, your Medicare refund claims, that that is actually something that's being assisted by technology. The information is not there in um, annual reports. It's not there on websites. Um, you really only find this information out, ironically, on blogs of people who have, you know, been there who have, um, you know, you get the occasional ombudsman report. Like there's, there's just not public information out there. And I think in some ways that's why everyone has leapt onto the Centrelink thing because I think that for a lot of people we weren't even aware that this stuff was happening. And then to find out that it's not just happening, but it's been happening for years, they've been planning it, you know, it's sort of like, come on guys, where, where were you? Where was the public debate? Where's the information? Um, so, look, and I think the, the point you raise about, you know, well, yes, I've been talking about the fallibility of human beings, um, but of course technology is also incredibly fallible and, and can have bugs, you know, either that are programmed into it that people don't identify at the time or maybe it's just not updated and so you know some amendment you know isn't picked up um, absolutely that is absolutely a risk with this and I think that it's one that agencies have to manage proactively um, so it may be that um, you know audit functions become a lot more important it may be that agencies don't just look at auditing, you know, financial performance, but things like performance audits become a lot more important that, you know, and just as you get, you know, your sort of financial books looked at every year, that you actually need, like, you know, a computer programmer to come in and just sit with a lawyer and check that your code is up to code each year. Um, I think that is absolutely something that should happen because the worst situation we could get, find ourselves in is that, you know, decisions are made and then the ombudsman decides to investigate or maybe the Senate decides to investigate or um, you know you have a judicial review and you've got you know people saying all right we now need you know and they go down to IT or whoever's sort of responsible for the system and says all right we need to explain how this system works and everyone looks around and says well, I, I don't know you know Bob designed that he left 12 years ago um, and that was actually something that I heard about when I delivered this, when I first delivered this speech. Um, I won't name names, but there was somebody who came up from an integrity body and said, um, you know, we actually had a problem with that, with an agency where uh, the, the, the technology was just flat out applying the wrong section and everyone knew it, but no one knew how to change it. So, yeah, I think this is not set and forget stuff. Any other questions? Any, any from our regional friends? No? All right, well, again, thank you everyone for coming today to hear about this, um, this topic. I, I do think that, um, you know, I, I appreciate that it is very much theoretical at this stage, but um, as we've seen in only the space of 12 months, um, this is how government is making decisions now. So I anticipate that we will see a lot more from here on in. So thank you for being um, some of the early adopters. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.